Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and I'm very honored here today to be here with Herman Lopez, who is a journalist for Vox. Um, welcome to Quality Policing. Hi, thanks for having me. So you are um, you seem to be unusual in the journalistic community now in that you've had the same job for, I think, I think you started in 2014, whenever Vox started, right? Is that 2014? Yeah, that's right. Um, so that's actually, I think, a long tenure in your business. Um, <laughs> it is. Uh, why? What What makes Vox unique um, in terms of your work? So for me, um, I came in as a, a writing fellow, which is like the lowest position you can start with in, in this kind of job. And um, I, very early on, I just developed an interest in criminal justice and drug policy issues. Uh, I think I've always had an interest in drug policy issues, in part because I have family members who've struggled with addiction. And if you know anything about drugs that like you'll naturally go to the criminal justice system at some point if you just follow that issue along. So that's kind of how I ended up just being interested in that. And I think what Vox has really allowed me to do is just Vox is really about providing context to current policy issues, uh, current political issues at current news events. And so it, it allows me to do, write these pieces that I just find much more fulfilling that are about like, okay, what do we actually know about this topic? What can, what, what can we actually apply from research studies, real world experience to actually help people and, and change lives and that kind of thing in a way that, I mean, if you're just covering like the crime numbers or the murder numbers and you just write an article about that and really don't provide any context as to like why that might be happening, what are the possible solutions here? I personally just don't find that as intellectually stimulating. For, for lack of a better term. So that's really where, where I come from with, with my coverage in Vox. And I don't remember when I first started reading your stuff, but I do, um, it's worth highlighting. Um, I certainly may, may have been the first thing I read of yours, the first thing I've noticed, but um, your 2016 piece called The War on Drugs Explained is a fabulous little summary of various elements of the drug war. And having written about that a lot myself, I, I think that's a nice, if people are interested in a good, summary of the drug war I'd, I'd, I'd go google that uh, the war yeah. on drugs by, by lopez and vox so but i i um i asked you to um come in today because your more recent piece which um it was uh september 27th in vox um titled murders are spiking police should be part of the solution um do you actually write the headlines at vox or, or is it like most places where you don't it's like a collaborative process. I think it's more collaborative than other places. So ultimately, I think um, the writers essentially suggest things and the editors uh, approve. Um, if a headline is just completely off, like just like the writer completely disagrees with it, it will not end up on the site usually. So it is collaborative. So in, in this case, this headline, I actually did write this headline, which is <laughs> something that I don't know. Some people might not like that reality, but, but, uh, that, well, cause there are a couple, we'll get to those later. Cause there are a couple yeah. that I want to push back on like American policing is broken in 2017. I'm curious. Um, sure. If you think that's still true or if we broke it even more, but well, maybe we'll get to that. Maybe not. Um, but let's talk about that. The murders are spiking. Cause this is something that is near and dear to me. Um, anyone who's <laughs> any of the three dozen people who are listening to this probably know that I started the violence reduction project, which is a collection of essays. Um, in response to last year's uh, spike in shootings and murders, uh, where people are saying this is what we can do now, short term, to um, to bring down violence. Um, so, I was, you know, concerned about this from when it started in late May and June. Um, what what did you find in your in your research for writing this this article? Sure. So, just to like explain why I wrote this article, it, it is largely pegged to the murder spike but originally when i when I started like thinking about this it was pegged to like conversations around defund the police um ultimately i think the article is not that explicitly about defund the police because my assessment is that side has kind of lost a lot of political weight with with the current administration and even democrats like the more on the left like the more leftish democrats have have kind of moved away from even talking about it much um so but but generally the idea was like okay let's look at the evidence on policing like how it did, should police play a major role in bringing down this obviously terrible rise in murders and yeah the what i found in the studies is like it's it's really hard to find studies that don't support the idea that policing, good policing can help bring down crime and violence. Um, there, I think the one of the 
the best recent studies on this was published in MBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, which has found each additional police officer abates approximately 0.1 homicides and that the effects are twice as large for black versus white victims. Um, there's two things going on there. One, more police do help bring down homicides, which obviously are the most serious of crimes. And then two, it helps black communities in particular, um, which I think is an important angle if, if we're talking about defund the police and Black Lives Matter. But then I went through that and it's like, when I, when I was asking Esther about this, they said like, look, yeah, there's, there's good evidence for this, but I think we can make police even more effective doing strategies like hotspots policing, problem-oriented policing, a uh, little less support for like focused deterrence because I think there's just less good research for it, but there's still support for it. And it, it, it essentially there's, I mean, there, if you look at the evidence, again, it's really hard to find research that says that these strategies don't work, that they don't r- bring down crime or violence because it seems like police just do that. You know, it might have been in relation to your piece because I see that I posted it on September 28th, but on, on my Cop in the Hood blog, I started compiling a list of the research on police and crime because um. Uh, and so the article you're referring to is um, Aaron Ch- uh, Chelfin et al., uh, 2020, Police Force yeah. Size and Civilian Race, um, National Bureau of Economic Research. And um, one of the things I find frustrating, especially last year, and it's caused me to bang my head against the wall, um, well, uh, is people just assert, you know, we know policing doesn't reduce crime, can't prevent crime. Um, at least I see that a lot. And I go, yes. I mean, that's just, it's a, it's a weird mantra. Uh, the problem is, I think, if you say it enough, a lot of people will start to believe it's true because you say it like you mean it. Um, so, and there is a fair amount of research on this stuff. Certainly, more research on non-police um, interventions to reduce violence. Um, that article you talked about, I have to say, you know, the article is nuanced, the whole thing. But in the summary, in the abstract, the idea that each police officer, you know, abates one tenth of a murder. Um, statistic is there something about that that bugs me because it doesn't you know you can hire a cop it's not just magically hiring a cop that causes a violent right. reduction and the article goes into this it's what that what you do with the police um and certainly if you have more cops you know you have more resources to do more stuff but um I, you know the articles always get summarized they need to be and, and simplified and i it, it's yeah that idea that it, that it's a direct correlation um it's necessary perhaps I don't even know if it's necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. Um, but it, it, there's just study after study that shows um, focused deterrence or pulling levers, hot spots, policing, foot patrol. Um, we actually know what works. And yet there's so, and you know, last year saw a step backwards a lot of this. And that maybe um, concerns my research more than your writing. Um, but the increase was real. Did you? So, Last year, I felt there was a, and they're still out there, uh, an active effort by many academics to um, uh, distract people, to deny the crime rise, and to distract people and say nothing to, nothing to see here. Um, is that something you have come across or have thoughts? Like, when, when were you convinced that shootings were up last year? So... I, I was convinced pretty quickly, and I think I was convinced pretty quickly because we saw something similar in 2015 and 2016 after there were those big protests in Baltimore, Ferguson, and really the, the whole country. They, they weren't as big as the George Floyd protests. Like, that was, that was much, much larger of a movement overall. But, I mean, we did see a spike in, in homicides back then, and... I'm not saying like the that I believe it's the exact Ferguson effect, right? Like that that's something that it's has been discussed a lot. Um, like it, I don't think we know exactly why it seems like these protests are apparently lead to more homicide. Maybe it's that police are are pulling back after these protests. Maybe it's a loss of trust in police as a whole, or you know, we 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 I think there's still a good questions around those issues but since we saw that happen before and can i just interject briefly because i have some people don't know about that increase um i'm just pulled it up so in 2015 um murders went up 11 percent in 2016 this is nationwide murders went up um another nine percent um that is a very large increase and it got so little attention um then then things were steady until last year when murders increased 28%, which is 
the largest increase by percent or raw numbers um, in American history. Um, and so this last year overshadowed that previous increase, but it was real and people don't know, know about it. Um, right. Yeah. I I'm think sorry. there was just a, a, like a push to move on as quickly as possible because of the implications of that are, I think they, they can, th there's room for everyone to get upset by these kinds of findings on, on the left, obviously the implications that black lives matter protests, like, might be in any way linked to an increase in murders if police officers are pulling back that angers them. And I think for, for good reason. On the right, though, um, the idea that police officers would react to criticism by backing off and like essentially, especially if they're doing it deliberately, like the blue flu or police strikes, it also has bad implications, I think, for that side. So I think for a lot of people that there were political incentives to essentially not emphasize this too much. Also, especially since Donald Trump got elected, I don't think he wanted to, you know, emphasize murders rising too much while he's in office. So the, the people who I think would normally be critical about that just kind of tried to stay quiet about that issue. Last year just made it impossible to ignore, though. Um, and I think what, what really did it for me is like, I, I believe COVID played a role, disrupted li people's lives. And of, of course that could lead to more, more violence in some sense. But for, for me, one of the key things here is what do 2015 and 2016 have in common with 2020? It's not COVID, obviously. It's, it's something about these protests, whether the sentiment that led to the protest to begin with or a reaction to the protest. And I, I think for me, that that's really what, what made it easy to understand this is something that's really happening and, and needs to be, something needs to be done about it. Um, if I could extend that parallel, and I don't know as much about it because neither of us were alive and I got a, <laughs> two decades on, on you. Um, similar things happened in the late 60s too. Right. Uh, you had protests and riots and a, and a massive increase in violence. Um, so I, I don't think it's even 24, 15 and 16 were the first time we saw those things. But you, you make a good point. Um, it's not that protesters went out and shot everybody up. It's not the protest directly, um, but there's some probable indirect causal effect. It led to something that led to something in which more people got shot. Right. Um, I mean, sorry, I was just going to say one, one way I think about this is if one police shooting is enough to trigger like massive national protests or just one example of a police killing somebody else, um, if that's enough to set up national protests, there's some underlying problem there, right? That is probably fueling, um, that might be leading people to just essentially not trust the police in some way, not work with the police in some way. And my hunch is that's that's probably going to lead to more crime and violence. Uh, when there's less trust in the police, there's probably going to be, the police's job is just going to be harder in terms of preventing crime and violence. Well, that, that legitimacy argument, I always find it a bit, odd or and often the ad i've so many people promote it disingenuous because i think it's important for police to have legitimacy um just because they're you know agents of force in a civil society um they, they got to be legitimate but a lot of people have been actively working to reduce police legitimacy <laughs> right. and then they complain that police lack legitimacy well maybe you shouldn't be telling people that police are the enemy to be abolished um my own thought is you know what gives police legitimacy it's not um, implicit bias training. It's not necessarily even community relations, though that's important. It's essential even. Um, it's effective policing. When people right. feel safe, they believe the system is, the, the criminal justice system, criminal legal system is legit. When they're afraid to go out of their house, that changes things. Now, that doesn't mean that they love the cops or anything like that. Um, they simply, you know, as people deserve to have a right to an expectation of public safety in, 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 a, in a civil society. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to attack police legitimacy because I believe in it, but I do want to attack sort of the framing and debate around it. Right. Um, the well, I think this is, this is one thing that's curious to me because I think there's a genuine disconnect between like progressive activists, which you see a lot of on social media and just like, normal people in the streets, including black and brown communities. I'm, and I'm sure you've done this. You go to a public police meeting and just see who is actually arguing for more patrols in their neighborhoods. It is not just a bunch of white, wealthy people, right? It is very often like these like black moms who are pissed off that their son is getting caught up by like, like in these gang shootings or something along those lines. 
and they would like more cops on the streets to like help them deal with these problems in their neighborhoods. And in fact, I think a curious dynamic in some of these meetings might be white progressives arguing with like black black families essentially because the white progressives think, hey, we we need to defund the police. Whereas like you see this and you see this in the polling too, the like that is just not a popular sentiment in like normie communities. So um, that, that's I, just... know, I meant to pull up that data. I forgot uh, before this, this, this discussion, um, because uh, Pew research survey after survey, I don't remember if it's Pew or Gallup or both. Um, they've asked this question for years about, you know, do you want more or same or less policing in your neighborhood? And consistently, um, meaning always uh, non-whites, Black and Hispanic people want more policing more than white people want more policing. Now, those same respondents also want better policing. And that right. doesn't sound too complicated, but a lot of people don't seem to understand you can want, you can be not happy with the police as they are and still want more of them because the alternative is worse. Right. Um, it is. I mean, I think you, you know, I was going to bring that up, but I think there is a real problem now in, in white progressives um, paternalistically telling other communities how they should be policed. Um, it's disrespectful, but it's also, I mean, people are dying because more people are dying. There's something that's that's deeper about this. Um, I had a talk, I won't mention his name, um, but with a professor who um, last year who was talking about defund and and potentially police abolition and alternative responses. And um, the college, like many colleges, not all, but many is in a, a safe, wealthy um, area. And um, I said, why don't you try it there first? It should be a pre- it should be an easier lift. You got money, you have very little violent crime. Um, see if it works there before trying to impose it on other people. Um, and our conversation kind of ended there. Um, but But yeah, even the people who... I mean, some people, there are police abolitionists and people say they want less policing in their neighborhood as well. But there's a lot of people who um, demand a certain level of, of police service and a certain level of enforcement where they live and somehow think that it's not appropriate or it's not right or that they're doing God's work on social justice by fighting for some cause. But yeah, go to community meetings, which but you know may not be completely representative of the community either. Right. Um, I, I kind of always push back even on the word community because it implies a monolithic entity, but I'm afraid people see them that. And um, it's not, it hasn't been productive, but, you know, defund does seem to amazingly have sort of lost its momentum and quite quickly um, after being all the way, you know, it sort of did become a flavor of the month last year. Well, I think the example of Minneapolis made it really like what we're talking about. Minneapolis exemplifies this, right? It was it was a diverse coalition of progressives, not not just white progressives in this case, but they did they tried to push for essentially defund the police, like a, a restructure the police department into a public safety department is how they framed it. But it was essentially the defund the police push, and they got you see this in the news reports again and again. They got a lot of pushback, particularly from minority communities who were seeing the spike in murders and were like, hey, we want more cops patrolling our neighborhoods, not fewer. So like, don't do this. And now the charter amendment, I think it is uh, that that's being actually going on the ballot actually allows for the public safety department to include police officers, which is just like an absurd way that this has turned where they're they're essentially keeping this idea of restructuring to a public safety department. But it's still going to involve police officers. So it's not even really clear what's going to change necessarily. It's just, it, but, but it speaks to what you're saying, right? That it is that, and it, it's a real world example of, of how these conversations play out. And in, yeah, the people, like people in these communities hit really hard by crime and violence do not want cops to just go away. Yeah. I don't think people, so much of America almost can't imagine hearing gunshots where they live mm. and a too large, um, though smaller part of America can't imagine not hearing gunshots. Right. Um, but I often worry that like people don't understand how traumatic violence is. Not even if you're not, even if you're not directly the victim, just to have it near you on your street, you know, your romantic dinner is ruined. Your kids aren't going to do their homework. I mean, there's lots of research showing that the um, shockingly negative effects of, of being uh, adjacent to violence. Um, my own thought is, you know, we do need other, we do need 
social programs and more funding for these things, though it doesn't have to and shouldn't come from policing. Um, but they're not going to succeed unless there's a level of public safety that allows these other programs to succeed. You know, after school programs are great. I mean that. But um, your kid has to be, still walk home after that, perhaps in the dark. Um, so that's, you know, you, you, that's the type of thing that, cr- that creates problems. Let me ask right. you, in your, because you're, as opposed to traditional print journalism, it, it's so, you know, you're much bigger on social media as, as an outlet. Um, I am assuming, but correct me if I'm wrong, that over the course of, of um, what are we at now, six, seven years that you've been doing this, you've gotten much more um, politely, I want to say pushback, but let's be honest, you know, stupid uh, hate mail and vitriol. I'm assuming, but tell me uh, that you get, got much more from sort of the, the pro-police camp in the course of, of, of your writings over the years. Is that true? Uh, I mean, you, you are, I assume, sort of lefty um, at some level, although maybe not. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm general. I mean, yes, I'm generally progressive. So I'll, I've gotten a. I mean, at this this point in the last year, um, like I've generally written about police reform, right? And like mm-hmm. this is probably a bunch of what you you saw early on in my work. And like I'm favorable, but for police reform, like my articles, I think are generally supportive of it. But the the last year has really like it's like the the movement just suddenly shifted way too far i think ahead of the evidence because my interest has always been essentially like like look i believe this evidence that police reduce crime and violence like it's pretty persuasive at the same time i take seriously a lot of the complaints that this research often does not weigh the costs of policing and people mean like everyday harassment or you know the feeling that a lot of people have that they're being hassled by cops way too often um, and, and on and on. So I take that seriously. But like, to me, that does not mean like those costs do not mean you just abandon policing. That means you build a model of policing that like minimizes those costs and maximizes the benefits. And for me, it just seemed like way too much of a switch to just like instead of trying that project seriously, which like I don't think enough places in the U.S. have just abandoning the whole model of policing and, and trying something else. That was a bridge too far. And so in the, in the past, all that is to say that in the past year, I've definitely gotten more, um, more of the anti-police defund the police crowd, essentially going after me on social media and, and whatnot. Did, did they revoke your progressive card? <laughs> Believe it or not. No, I'm, I'm still allowed to write and uh, lots of people read my work. So <laughs> it's good. Um, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm over the years I, I've, you know, I've, have certain quibbles, but they're not that many um, names that I see in print when I say, okay, this, you know, this will probably be a good piece. So, I mean, that, that's why I asked you here, because I, I do respect what, what, what you've written over the years. Um, in, in the recent piece, you, oh, well, let me go. Did you receive, like, did you, but just by being pro-reform and previous stuff, even those words, did that get, get you pushed back? Um, I would say, not as much as you might have expect. I think what you see more of is it's not it's not like people are saying I'm anti-reform necessarily. Like they're they're not necessarily against like um I, I mean it, I think you see this in the polling too, right? If you ask people about specific police reforms, like should cops wear body cameras, should uh you should they do like certain restraints on people, like there's generally wide support even among more conservative people for those kinds of things. I think what I see often is just like, well, you don't care about uh, black on black crime or something along those lines. That's that's usually the kind of pushback, sort of like just trying to flip the conversation in a different uh, direction than like whether these reforms are a good idea. How do you as a writer and thinker deal with, um, I mean, that phrase is is taboo, at least in the left. Yet the problem is very real. Call it what you will. One of the things I, I mean, blacks are far disproportionately likely to be the victims um, of, of violent crime. In, in New York City, uh, 90, I believe it's 96%. And I like asking people this, what they think first, because everyone lowballs the figure. Um, but approximately 96% of sh- shooters and those who are shot or killed are black or Hispanic. Um, it's a shocking figure, um, which means you know three or four percent are white or Asian, and collectively that's. Um, you know, I'm worried about saying New York City demographics off the top of my head. I think collectively yeah. that's that's um, well, it's I think it's 55, maybe 60 percent of the population. Um, 
we don't have the language to talk about this. Right. I don't think. Um, and I want to ask how you do talk about it, but I, I say part of the, pro- the problem to me is police then get blamed for despair, for reacting to disparities in society that they didn't cause. Um, mm-hmm. But police get blamed for reflecting those disparities. And then one of the results we've seen is less policing and the disparities have actually gotten worse. But how do you um, deal with the third rail issues of, of race and semantics and framing and yeah, I mean, this the phrase black on black crime, like you mentioned, it's definitely politically charged now. And I think like there are good reasons, I think, in like in my writing to avoid a phrase like that, because it carries meanings for a bunch of people, including some frankly racist people who, who are using it. I've gotten some very ugly emails, too, along those lines where people are just explicitly racist. For me personally, though, like I I, I just think about the victim here, like really, it, I, I don't know. It, I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this, but like, if I could say maybe as a hope, my thought is, you know, race is going to racist. Um, right. I don't want to engage those people. And I don't think they're smart enough to think this way, but my God, what if they actually succeeded in hurting um, minorities simply by getting people not to talk about the subject? Like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I try, I just, yeah, I don't want them to be my friends. Well, I just I mean, associate myself from that, but, but I don't care what they say. There, there is a problem. Right. Um, and I mean, there there are protests in Chicago led by like black church leaders, for example, that will use the phrase "we need to black on black crime" in the context of like we need to stop black on black crime because what they're saying is not the way that racists are saying. They're saying it's like this is a problem in our community. We need to acknowledge it and we need to do something about it. And I think that's generally where I try to look at this is like by focusing on the victims here, which as you mentioned are majority black. Um, it's like this is just awful and for the, if if you think black lives matter like a natural conclusion is you should care about this issue you mentioned earlier that i don't think people fully appreciate the idea of like being surrounded by gun violence how how much that affects you um so i i come from venezuela and one thing I don't have like deep memories of this because I was fairly young when I immigrated here but one thing my mom has told me is that one of the reasons we moved here is because um the my parents uh, started hearing just way more gunshots outside since like we were this was around the mid 90s and they at one night it was so bad that they had to like come to the like where my brother and I were sleeping and cover our bodies like because they thought there's a chance that the bullets are going to fly through our, house, our apartment and hit us and like you, you know like thankfully I don't have a deep memory of that but living in that kind of environment is horrific like we should do everything in our power to make sure that's not happening. And that's really where I come from. And again, I just go back to, if you listen to these communities, like these black and brown communities about what their concerns are, they take this issue very seriously and they do want someone to solve it, including the police. So that's kind of how I approach it, regardless of what racists are saying. I think it's, it's still an issue worth taking seriously. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. I, I, <laughs> didn't do enough research. I didn't know you were from Venezuela, by the way. (laughs) Um, The, let me ask about, what did I want to get to here? Um, In in earlier this year, you you wrote an article, which I think I did maybe publicly push back a bit on. I I went um, and looked at any Twitter exchanges we've had to make sure I didn't say anything nasty about you that I forgot (laughs) about. I don't think I did. And I probably didn't have reason to, Um, but um, in terms of, I mean, so you mentioned church groups, you know, you mentioned Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter was specifically, or at least started specifically about the issues of policing. Like it maybe is another phrase that was not the, well, I guess it was, I think it was very effective, um, but it wasn't really about crime. It was about police abuse. So I think some people push back Actually, on that. Actually, you know, I, I, would, I would actually push back on that though, because it originally started with George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. Like that's really the root of that. And that was not technically a police officer, right? So it was like a- and Not only not technically, it, it wasn't. <laughs> no, yeah. Like, so so it's just to say that like, obviously it's not from the same perspective we're talking about, like serious violence within minority communities, but it's still like, it, it kind of shows that this this has, um, this, this has deeper roots than just police. And also I think it's been expanded in some circles to mean like, hey, we should take 
health disparities seriously. We should take education disparities seriously and so on and so forth. So that that's kind of just how I would think about that phrase. So when people talk about disparities, um, and you do in, in, in many of your pieces, as you should, I always worry about the lack of a, an appropriate denominator. Um, mm. You know, to, you, to keep it in a criminal justice focus, um, yeah, Blacks are disproportionately represented um, in all levels of the criminal justice system, um, including prison. But what percent of prisons, what should the racial breakdown of prisons be? Um, I assume, I mean, if, you know, thir- roughly 13% of America is, is Black. Um, should 13% of prisoners be Black? Well, in an ideal world, um, but we don't have an ideal world. Um, you, you know, with the war on drugs, it gets much more complicated and, and the disparities are, are much less defensible. Um, but given other, you know, given disparities, disparities in serious violent crime with, with real, you know, victims and death, um, perhaps, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, are disparities the wrong way to look at things? And perhaps we should be looking at the problem more than, than the, the, the reflection of that that we see, uh, you know, downstream in, in, in the system. Right. Um, well, I think one way I look at it is like you, you can see those charts of like disparities in, in police shootings or police killings. And you can end the conversation there. Right. And like say, well, then police are the problem. Or you can do what you're talking about, where you look upstream more. Right. To me, those those I don't know. I agree with you that a lot of people look at those charts and see them as kind of like the end of the conversation. For, for me, it's really about the beginning of the conversation like if if we like this just represents a problem like whether or not the police are justified in these individual shootings or or whatever actions they might have taken like we don't want to live in a society where one group is disproportionately affected by police and then the other and like then you can go upstream and like talk about what's causing that is it economic issues is it other social issues cultural issues whatever it might be and go through there i think since my work primarily focuses on criminal justice like that's my beat it'll often like my articles will often focus on this criminal justice side but at the same time i don't know i i i do and like like I do want to write articles about this stuff. I do enjoy reading articles about this stuff that gives like a broader lens because I, as I think you're alluding to, it is important to this topic, right? Like, and in fact, that's, I think what some of the defund the police like movement was rooted in is like, we need to address these other root causes of crime. I think where they went wrong is that does not necessarily mean, well, that does just, that just does not mean you have to defund the police to fund these other programs. It means you have to like do everything in your power to like solve all, all these, these problems, including crime violence and See, anything that might be I, I underlying. I think it was disingenuous because now New York city is always an outlier and it's unique as for cities. Cause it's got more money than other cities, but New right. York city puts a lot more money into social services than policing. And, right. You know, the largest chunk of the budget is this thing called a uh, department called human resources. No one's ever heard of it. I mean, a lot of people have, cause it gets like $11 billion a year, but that includes <laughs> homeless services and it's an umbrella department for all the other social services, but it's, it's almost twice as large uh, or maybe it is more than twice as large as the police budget. Um, the idea that somehow another couple hundred million dollars is going to solve problems right. and it has to come from police, which therefore means coming from the 20 percent of the police budget that isn't payroll. Um, I don't know if I, I, I think a lot of the supporters of defund were what you just said, you know, they wanted to solve these problems. And um, there were some wildly uh, misleading ideas of what percent of budgets go to policing and municipality. If you combine city and state spending, it's, it's like three to 6% of the total budget. Um, it depends right. on who funds schools and things like that. But you saw people saying, oh, police are taking half our budget. Well, yes, but it's a weird pie. Or, anyway, um, but I, the, where I'm getting at is I think defund was rooted in abolition and defund was a successful phrasing that, that got traction. Um, but I think a lot of, so not of the supporters so much, but the, the root of the movement, I think, would be happy to abolish police without mm. funding these other programs. So they like to do both. Um, but I do think it was, you know, it wasn't just about how it was about hurting police. Um, the, the cities that did defund 
um, New York, Minneapolis, Seattle, Portland, maybe Austin, I forget. Uh, and, you know, most cities didn't, but a lot of it was vindictive. Um, yeah. It wasn't I like. See, I see what you're saying. Like, I, I guess it may, maybe root of the movement isn't the right word, but I think a lot of the people who got captured by that phrase do not actually believe in police abolition. And in fact, you see this all the time, just about any time you, I tweet about defund the police. Like I will get one tweet that's like, well, this doesn't mean literally defunding the police or literally abolishing the police. And then I'll also get another tweet saying, yes, abolish the police, which is like just shows the split there. I think a lot of people who ended up getting captured by this phrase really just took it as like a phrase meaning reform the police. And like, yes, we should fund these other social services because these social services are by and large stuff that people on that political movement, like the progressive side, support anyway. So why wouldn't they? Um and and I, I so so maybe it's not the root of the movement uh, necessarily believes believes in these other programs like I'm, I was saying, but it is at least the people who have like thrown popular support and I think made it mainstream to some degree. I just my my complaint is it's so putting the cart before the horse. Um, right. We can solve these. It's not my professional field, and you know, I don't have the solutions. Um, I would like other people to work on that. Um, I'll focus on how to make policing better, um, but as soon as police don't get called for mental health issues or homeless related issues, you know, that's great. Um, so fix them. I don't, you know, it's not my job. I mean, police officers would say this stuff, right? Absolutely. Like, they don't want to deal with this, but they also know they have to because. Right. Cause nobody else is. And, but like, the, I think the thing that got gets a bit lost here is like, you often see like comparisons to other countries where people say, well, in this other country, police don't respond to mental health calls or they do this or they, they're not even armed. And I think the key thing missing there is, well, those these other countries don't have anywhere near the level of guns that the U.S. has. And this is a constant thing. If you just talk to any officer, they'll tell you that, like, regardless of whether they're like super pro Second Amendment or not, they will tell you that, like, look, the reality is as a police officer, I go into every call expecting that there might be a gun there and I have to act accordingly. Like they, their guard is up. And same thing with social workers, right? Like if they see somebody freaking out because they're having a mental health crisis, they are have to be worried in the US and in particular in some parts of the country that are more heavily armed that th that person might have a gun. And like, again, you can say whatever you want about gun rights and gun control and all that stuff, but that's just the reality that people have to work in. And I think that that just adds another element of like how ridiculous it is to say that like, there should be no armed presence for for some of these calls, even the ones that are technically nonviolent, because, I mean, the, the second you do this model and a social worker gets shot, like all those social workers are going to start demanding that they should be armed. Like, I think you saw this parole and probation officers who originally were not armed. And now a lot of them are armed because the people they were dealing with they ended up causing trouble for them occasionally. So you know, it's a while it's, back, I Googled um, like social worker killed. Um, and I was kind of shocked um, how there are a lot of results. Um, right. It's not, I mean, it's rare in the grand scheme of, you know, 16,000 murders a year in America, but um, it, it's, it's, it's a risky job. Uh, and and the dozen, yeah, I was kind of surprised how many examples I could just find, um, you know. So, um, and I think it was in response to that idea. My my problem with the idea of saying, "Oh, police shouldn't respond to it," is the, it, it's misfocusing the problem. The problem isn't the police response. The problem is somebody has to respond at all. Right. Um, the solution has to prevent the need for a response. So it's as I'm thinking of particularly mental health issues. Um, but also homeless related issues, but let's in mental health, if someone's in crisis, you know, it might be nominally better if a social worker responds than the cop, though I'm not convinced that's the case. Certainly if the social workers pick the easy cases to respond to the ones where there's no danger. Um, but the problem is someone still has to respond. We failed. Those other countries have health care. They have mental health care. Mm -hmm. um, there's just less visible craziness. Um, in the streets that they have to respond to. That's got to be the goal. It's not about over oh, the, and they have people say, well, what's, I say, well, what's, look, I don't know, you know, some cops are better than others and some departments are better than others. Um, but what's so bad about having a cop respond? Like, well, yes, um, I have some numbers here. In 2018, the NYPD responded to 180,000 emergency calls involving people having in a mental health crisis. 
Um, what is that per day? 180,000. Four. So that's almost 500 calls a day. Right. Um, 21 calls an hour, though, of course, they're not evenly spread through the day. Um, they buy, you know, and they handle pretty, you know, they handle them pretty well. Um, cops are already there. We're already paying them to respond to the, to these issues. Um, and people say, well, yeah, as soon as a gun comes on the scene, that's a problem. Well, and they, you know, this is America. Now, New York City, of course, is tougher gun laws, but this is America. There's a, there's a gun on most scenes. Right. There are, you know, and, however many hundreds of millions of guns out there and people carrying them. There's something very precious about people who are like, but you can't bring a gun. Like, I, look, I, I would love to have European style gun control and low levels of crime, but th- we don't. Um, so, to, right. you know, deal with it. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think what you were saying there is that you would prefer to not let people get into a crisis point to begin with is just that's kind of it for me. Like it, it's kind of in some ways, it's always felt like this this idea that you defund the police and put that towards social service is exactly backwards because like you want to fund these social services. So there are fewer mental health calls and then you might see less of a need for police going to those kinds of situations and maybe they can do other things. Right. And, and it, but like it's. Obviously, that's not how people, I don't think, I think in the end, people just kind of like built this model in the aftermath after they started saying defund the police because of what you were saying. A lot of them are just, they really true, truly do want to abolish the police. But um, it is just to say that like, like that should be the starting point. If you really see these as a problem, and I definitely do, I've, I've written about addiction and mental health for years as well as the criminal justice. And like, of course, uh, like we should be, taking those cases more seriously, making sure people have access to healthcare. And as anybody, any journalist would tell you who's in this field, we are not doing that a very good job at that. Just about every advocacy group who puts out a report on this will tell you that the US does not adequately fund mental health or addiction treatment by any means. So it's just to say we could be doing much more there and like that would solve a big part of this problem. Yeah. I mean, I look, a police response could be better, but they do. We have to reimagine response. No, reimagine the treatment that we uh, have. Right. Um, but I, it's, it's, but all the, I mean, maybe I'm missing it because it's not my social or professional world, but I don't see any talk about reimagining the mental health world so that people don't have crises that, that, that demand that demand response. Well, I think it's just such a, I mean, obviously it gets to do issues about universal health care and how you restructure the healthcare system and all of that, because it is, like the, the way the U.S. funds healthcare is also one of these insur- like insurance companies, but also just like this patchwork of funding mechanisms through the federal, state and local level, something we were getting at earlier, which is in, like it is just so disconnected from what might be happening on the ground at times that like it's not even clear if the funding is going to the right things. Right. So anyway, that's a bigger conversation that we probably mm-hmm. don't want to get into. But it is it's just to say that there, the, that it is such a big problem that I think anybody has. There is no catchy slogan for for solving it necessarily. We got to come up with one. <laughs> um, like the, go back to policing and reform since the murder of George Floyd. Um, has anything gotten better, in your opinion? Has any what what tell me some productive reform that's happened? Because I have a tough time doing this. <laughs> well, we did have a study come out recently that said actually tied to the the protest to fewer police shootings. So maybe like if it, shootings went up a little bit last year. Um, um I, I can't least, remember what, what model they use or or anything okay. like that, but it like that. Um I would say though. I mean, we just saw it in Congress fail, right? Like, I think, I I don't know what the major political hurdles are necessarily. I mean, there's obviously a lot of split between Democrats and Republicans about qualified immunity and all of that. But it it is just, I don't know. There just seems to be very little interest in actually rethinking what, like, for me, it's a step-by-step process. You should think, what do you actually want police officers to do? Okay, and, and like if you decide that they shouldn't be doing uh, low level drug busts, that they shouldn't be doing traffic, like you can agree or disagree with that. But I'm just saying, like, if, if that's what you decide that they should be focusing on, like, say, violent and property crimes, then build a model where they only have to do that. And you're not essentially throwing all these other jobs on them because nobody else is picking up that slack. We are just not doing that. So it's, I think as long as we we don't do that, we take like this idea of like ground up reforming the police seriously. 
I, I'm just not sure if we can actually fix the problems that, that we're talking about here. Well, and the reason I mentioned off the, at the top about when we started um, this idea that you wrote in 2017, the policing is broken. I guess when I get one of the things that bothered me last year, along with it sort of being amateur hour in the reform movement, like, you know, there are people who have been doing this for decades. Um, I would argue, I have argued that policing has been slowly, but surely, um, you know, a little bit too slowly and a little bit, not surely enough getting better over decades um, by quantifiable means that people say they care about. And whether that's reducing the number of people killed by cops um, whether it was until recently keeping violence down, you know, some basic standard of police effectiveness. Um, in car- I mean, af- there was a long way to go, but incarceration numbers um, have been coming down. So at least we've ended increasing mass incarceration. Um, slow incremental improvements. I mean, let's take, you know, my old city of Baltimore as an example. Um, until Freddie Gray Crime was down, arrests were down, Um, population actually went up briefly for the first time in 50 years. Um, Thing like, I don't think the system, again, I don't don't wanna overstate that everything was great because God knows it's not, but it was getting better. And then people, and you're, you're, I'm gonna blame you personally. No, but people decided, you know, the system's broken. Um, I don't know right now, if we could just magically turn back the clock to 2017, I think it would be, we'd be better off. is that the, I'm, I guess I'm saying, why, why does it have to be framed in that because it's not perfect that it's broken? Well, I think for, for me, the, the underlying sentiment is, is kind of what you alluded to that it's just not happening quickly enough. I mean, as, as a journalist and like one thing you hear consistently from not, not even just advocates, but like academics too, is just like, we've had this evidence of how to improve policing for a while like we we have these strategies that focus more on proactive policing practices for a while right and it's just this growing frustration that the longer we have these better methods of policing and do not use them it just like the longer we get from like discovering that to not actually implementing it on a mass scale it just gets more and more frustrating and i think at some point it like you stop giving people latitude and you start saying like, look, if you're just not following this, then what you're doing is, is screwed up. It's, it's broken in some sense. So that's, that's where I come from. I do agree with you though, that it's generally gotten better. I mean, you see that clearly in the numbers, right? Like, uh, but does that I, matter if we just go from outrage incident? Like what do the, I worry that it's irrelevant that we've gotten better, that we're going to demand perfection. I mean, there's going to be another horrible police involved shooting next month. I mean, just odds are, whether it gets traction, well, I, mean, you know, I, I so- think it, it it's almost the opposite. A lot of the activists in this area now do not want to emphasize anything getting better because it hurts their message, right? Like it is much harder to argue that police should be reformed if you're saying like they're already getting better. So I think that's that's part of it too, particularly from the advocacy place that like you you just don't want to emphasize things getting better. Hmm. But then, so this year you wrote. Um, police officers are rarely prosecuted and there's something about um what is two percent oh that's the headline that I, police officers are prosecuted for murder in less than two percent of fatal shootings um i'm actually surprised it's that high uh but i still go like to me that was a so what um what number should it be um should it be a hundred percent should it be like i i, I don't know I, I yeah it struck me as odd what, what were your thoughts behind i mean the article, well, of course, because you wrote it, is more nuanced. But why frame it in that <laughs> sense? I guess the the top line, the headline is just, I, I don't know. I see it as fine because it is just the fact represented in the article. And like, um, it'll bring people into the article because I think a lot of people will find that statistic shocking. And then they'll read as to what goes into that. Um, what if you had I, phrased that police officers are prosecuted for murder in more than 1% of fatal shootings? Would that have like changed it? <laughs> I, I guess not, but I don't know. I don't know why that would seem odd. <laughs> I think I think it's because it's so vague, more than 1%. That's like oh, 99%, right? Like, I don't know. Right. I'm just saying by saying more, you could, you know, it implies that it's too many by, you know, less is a semantic way to say, you know, to, well, to draw attention to the low number as opposed to, I don't know, maybe that's the right number. One in 50? I don't know. 
I think when I added up the numbers, it does seem too low anyway. Like it, it's it's hard for me to believe. I believe that most of these shootings are probably justified on, at a legal, like from a legal goal perspective, and maybe even just from like a moral perspective. Like like we were talking about, there are lots of guns out there, lots of people pulling guns out on others, including police officers. So I believe that probably most of these are justified. But like the number was so tiny that like it, it's it's just hard for me to believe that human beings meaning police officers are not making mistakes more often. Of course, they're um, not supposed to be prosecuted for mistakes. I mean, that's a legal standard. I also, I bet if you went back a few years, I think the number would be closer to 0%. It would be right. more than zero. That would be a well, weird actually, I, <laughs> but I think, I think the article mentions that, that it, it's gotten a little higher over the years since uh, the, the original Black Lives Matter protest. It was almost the, never. For, I mean, yeah, that's so, true. Right. So it's getting better. Like, like but again but so um, what you mentioned and this may be uh, yeah may take you off your your, your focus you mentioned yeah they make mistakes but i think that's an important point because i think part of the problem in the old days you know cops used to worry about messing up and getting in trouble hmm. um now i think cops are worried about actually doing the job correctly and getting in trouble because you know they use force and there was a viral video of them you know struggling with trying to get someone in cuffs um But part of the standard, and this relates to qualified immunity, though I think less than people think, but this idea that police are given a great leeway um, to make mistakes. Um, The Supreme Court over the years, over the decades, has has been, despite what cops think, incredibly generous to police officers saying, you know, we recognize it's a tough job and we don't want to armchair academics to, to, in fact, I think use that phrase, to judge uh, police action. But a mistake is different from a crime. So do you prosecute every mistake? I mean, the typical standard was negligence, which is a pretty high standard. Um, And the typical standard for shooting was, you know, reasonable, was a reasonable standard based on the moment the cop shot, which is interesting because it means, um, like with Tamir Rice, you can mess up in everything up to that moment, but the shooting's still justified. Um, So those are very generous standards. But yeah, just the the word mistake caught my ear. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I'm using them like kind of a loose layman term, like not so much like the legal way that the way you might use it in a courtroom. Right. But it also gets at this. uh, I mean, first of all, the Tamir Rice shooting is like one of the more horrifying examples, I think, for me in terms of like a police shooting that I've seen. And like that to me, it's. It's kind of it's kind of what you were talking about earlier. Where we want to look up. Let me just mention for people who don't remember, this is the the kid in uh, Cleveland who had the replica oh, yeah. gun, and cops pulled up and shot him. Right. That to me is um like raises questions about like why do the police officers stop, park their car, literally feet to oh, feet? The tactics away were from horrible. I would even right. say negligent. But like, yeah, th- th- it's just to get to this point that I think a lot of the like whether you want to call them mistakes, errors, something else, whatever you want to call them happen before, like it's, it's about like getting to the point where you, you feel like you have to pull the trigger. Right. And like, you want to avoid getting to that point. That should be the overall goal. And I think the way we deploy police officers or police officers just act in these situations where they're, I mean, adrenaline's kicking in, they're rash, like they're, they might be angry at a suspect who's running away or something else. Um, just creates these situations where they end up pulling the trigger more often than they should. And I wrote this just, just to like go along this. I I wrote an article a few years back, I think it was called tyranny of the traffic ticket, but it was basically just looking at the, because of the way that police are deployed so often in like traffic stops and because they are so often deployed in minority communities, like just by virtue of that, you're going to have more police officers shooting unarmed black people and that's going to result in like some of these skewed numbers but the issue there might not be that the police officer pulled the trigger at the point that they did it might be that like maybe you didn't need police doing these kinds of traffic stops or maybe you didn't need the police doing uh like being deployed in these neighborhoods as aggressively to begin with and it's just like looking at that i think in a more upstream manner i think it's very clear in the tamir rice shooting example where they should not have pulled their car in front of this kid but like from, from a broader perspective may, it is about rethinking i think some of like what police do on a general basis you know when i was in the police academy 21 years 20 yeah 21 years ago almost 22 years ago um and you know we watched the standard um snuff films of cops getting killed by people hmm. um which i 
say cavalierly. It, there is part of the training needs that. Um, it may be overemphasized, or it needs it needs to be also put in context. But that is part of the training to say, you know, look how quickly this seemingly innocent situation um, can become violent. You can be killed. I mean, every cop knows the name Dink Keller, and I don't think anyone who's not. Do you know the name Dink Keller? The Dink Keller video? I doubt you do. No, it was, it was I, one of the I, original. I, now you can Google it. It's still out there, but every cop's seen it. Um, though there are probably others now that are shown in, but my point was, okay, we've seen these, but you know what else a lot of these have in common is every cop is fishing for drugs. Not everyone, mm. but a lot of that, like, okay. Uh, yeah. You do have to be on guard and people have guns and sometimes people want to ambush cops, but I don't know as a cop. I, I mean, I never really cared if you had drugs in your car, quite frankly, or at least I didn't take it personally. Um, right. Uh, so that I was like, well, if we're really worried about officer safety, why are we trying to search cars? Because what good does that do? I understand it's a crime, um, but you know, is that preventing any real violence or death? I mean, you know, I know some people might say maybe, um, but I, I, that was what I remember just thinking that why why are cops doing this? Um, well, I mean, that, that speaks to like what what yeah, like exactly what I was saying. It's like upstream. Like, should cops be doing these things to begin with? There are, there are places in the country where like speeding tickets are basically all automated. Um, like they just use cameras and send you the ticket and all of that. And like, uh, uh, that's one example of technology enabling to get the police out of these kinds of stops. But well, let me, let me, why don't we do more? Let me push back on that a bit. Um, I'm all for it. Look, I don't even own a car. I hate cars. Um, I don't have a car. (laughs) I live in New York city. Um, I want automated enforcement. I want police enforcement, um, partly through vision zero, but there's been a progressive move. Like what's the next thing we can take police out of and traffic enforcement has come up. Mm. Um, yes, there are racial disparities. You know, Ed Flynn, the former commissioner of Milwaukee addressed that well. He used traffic stops for the purpose of violence prevention, which does have some proven data behind it. But he said, we don't want to doubly punish people who live in high neighborhoods with fines. So he, he, and he made this clear at community meetings and told cops where our, when we pull someone over pretextually um, because the real context being violence prevention, it's not quite a pretext stop. It was a real stop, but um, give them warnings. We're doing this for violence. Um, we don't want to find people just because we have more police presence. I thought it was a very good way to um, deal with it. He still got sued by the ACLU. So you can't, you can't sort of win on that level. But if we went to automated traffic enforcement, first of all, we, the problem of, fake licenses, fake tags um, is growing and real. Um, automated enforcement won't stop that. Autom- you know, the, um, we can do, I want speed cameras as well. But one of the things I've asked people who have advocated for this is what makes you think that would decrease racial disparities? Um, if you put cameras where the traffic accidents happen, you're still going to have racial disparities in enforcement. And that's assuming that people drive similarly in different neighborhoods, which I don't think is true. Um, it's not going to achieve the basic goal if the goal is equity of enforcement. Um, I, yeah, automated. It's not. It's the idea that these disparities are caused purely by discretion um, isn't really found out. I mean, the, yeah, where are you going to put the cameras? Um, I hope well, you're going to put it where people are dying. Well, I would say one. I think there are there's some evidence that it is at least partially caused by discretion. Like police officers are more likely to stop like people of color well there's so, I, I think you know it is more likely to search um cars well, driven by black people it. but the yes. stops may be less so but but you're right that you have more police where there's more violence and that also has an impact even right. if it's not from bias just from that presence but i mean i would say the the social value of what you're describing like let's say it's true you you put these cameras in place and there are still racial disparities at that point it shows that the issue is not the police necessarily it is like this is an automatic system, right? So it is, then you have to ask like, what are the underlying causes here? Like, what what do we need to get at if it, the problem was not police driving these racial disparities? Well, so I think there's still a value there in, in, in the long term, even if it doesn't solve the problem necessarily that it's, some people are hoping it would solve. Well, then I think a lot of the people who are, the, not most people, but a lot of people who are pushing for that enforcement will say the problem is then the laws are racist. Um, so we have to change the rules. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I think I think, I don't it's think true there's for, an end game there. I think that's true for people on social media to some extent. But I think I, I like to think like normal people who aren't as online as perhaps you and I are are a little more more reasonable. You know, like they, they, they there's like a, a nuance that just gets lost in all these conversations, especially when they happen on the Internet. But 
like you mentioned, like uh, this idea of like cops pulling back on traffic stops and like how, well, maybe one way to do that is just giving people warnings instead of like hot tickets. That is cops pulling back on some of the enforcement they were doing before to some extent. Like they're now not just, they're not throwing this large fine on somebody anymore, but it is like, I think way too often, this is a huge problem with just our political discourse in general is everything's framed in such black and white terms that like, like these, those kinds of solutions just seem like tame or boring or not as exciting to cover in the news or talk about on social media, even though they are getting at the problem that we're talking about here. Mm. What, um, what, what, what are you, do you think, I want to ask, should we be focusing more on class in America? Do you have any opinion on that? It's kind of a question from left field, but as an alternative to sort of our, our exclusive focus on race. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think uh, one thing you see throughout the past few decades as, as like the, the welfare state has changed, as like social programs have come up, is a lot of these programs that are technically race neutral end up helping disproportionately people of color, people in minority communities. Um, the, the massive crime drop that we've seen in the last few decades, that was not necessarily framed as let's make sure that murders and crime in black communities drop, right? That was framed as like, we want all crimes and murders to drop, but like the communities that have benefited the most by virtue of having the most murders were those minority communities. So I think the, the thing is, is that very often when, when you ask people like experts, like, okay, how do you solve this social problem? Like it can be disparities in life expectancy, for example. They'll give you a bunch of race neutral solutions that it just so happens they would help um, minority communities because they are often the ones struggling with the lower end of the economic or social ladder and just getting help through those kinds of programs would help. So I, I find it, I personally think it's just more I think it's politically useful to just frame things as class-based instead of race-based because you don't alienate li- large segments of the population who, whether they're racist or just um, have like some other feeling against using, like being called racist, right? They don't want anything implying that they might be racist or that their ancestors is something racist or whatever it might be. They, they are much more open to, I think, hearing, hey, let's try this race-neutral solution than this like race-specific solution. Um, so politically, what what I would get pushed back from? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. But I, as you know, there are people. I mean, <laughs> America does have a unique race history. Um, it does sort of make, let, in some ways, it lets us off the hook too easily. But I say we, meaning America, um, white America in particular. Um, but I'm all for solutions more than uh, more well, than framing. My. Uh... One of my former colleagues, Matty Glacius, has this thing where he says that like political activists should just put um, like a post-it note on all their computers, like campaign people in political campaigns, essentially, that says the app, the median American voter is a non-college educated 50 something white person. And like once you understand politics through that perspective, because that is true, that is a median American voter. Like, how do you appeal to this person, even if you think race is this like systemic racism is a serious issue that needs to be solved. And like, of course, I think that's true. Like, how do you get that person to support a program that actually tackles systemic racism? Uh, And like, maybe the way to frame it is that it is not actually about racism, but something else. I mean, just, just to give a concrete example, here's the minimum wage minimum wage would massively benefit minority communities like a higher minimum wage i should say and it has pretty good support if you look at the polling it is never framed by the politicians who talk about it as a race issue i think in part because they understand that if they frame it as a race issue it will make it less popular so it's like but it would have like disproportionately racial effects by benefiting these minority communities and i think that's that's something we could use more of i think in the criminal justice space to kind of tie all of this together is like like mass incarceration it is true that black people have been disproportionately affected but so have a lot of white people they've also been caught up in these like punitive tough on drug laws right and like 
maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. And like framing that, I think in more race neutral terms would probably get more people on board. And in fact, I think it is why movements like right on crime, the Koch brothers and, and so forth have gotten on board is because they see it as a bigger societal problem than just the racial disparities. Yeah. Um, I don't want to, I probably should wrap up. I, it, it isn't, I don't think a lot of people know that there is a s- surprisingly strong, uh, criminal justice reform movement coming from conservatives, particularly in Texas of all places right. that simply saw it as a moral issue, um, but actually well, accomplished some good. Well, I think it, it's even more interesting because I think since Republicans are, are just naturally, I think politically much better able to dodge ac- accusations that they're soft on crime. I think some of them have used that to essentially be more aggressive on criminal justice reforms than perhaps some of their blue or democratic counterparts like 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 you mentioned texas but really you you can look at a bunch of these red like deep red states um georgia not so much anymore but when it passed criminal justice reforms a few years ago it was like leading like it was ahead of a lot of the country including democratic states and it was at the time fairly deep red it was not 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 a swing state like it is today same thing with uh south carolina i mean you could just go down the list but it is is, it's an interesting dynamic there why why does the left assume the word reform is good um the the, i'm pro reform i'm actually not pro reform i'm pro progress if that is if reform is good i'm for it but this idea of the you know we need to reform. I don't know. To tell me the details. The devil's always in the details. Um, maybe let me last sort of theme segue here. It does segue into this, this a bit. Um, but I'm fascinated. I presume you're familiar with um, the video that came out, whatever, two, three days ago with his gang shooting in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Um, and it does... Uh, it doesn't have a name yet. So I don't know how people will find this. who don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, there was a, a on video in Chicago, two cars pull up outside a house there's a mutual extreme exchange of gunfire people are shot i think one is killed um a cop happens to like pull up on the scene and pretty ballsy comes out and sort of almost in the middle of a gunfight and goes to the person who was wounded or dead anyway the the cars pull off um later not on the video the people and barricade themselves in the house the swat team shows up uh it's resolved peacefully uh, but the, I believe they don't find any guns in the house. So someone had already ran off with the guns. Um, cops uh, arrested five people um, and uh, the prosecutor in Cook County, Fox, um, declined felony charges and released the individuals, um, which shocks my conscience. Um, I understand it might be a hard to win case, but you got to get them on something. Um, do you have any insight or what, what's your take on this? I think it may be a turning point in the progressive prosecution movement because it's so egregious. I mean, Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, um, and I'm Chicago born, by the way, so I do have particular interest in these and Chicago issues, um, who has not been seen as a friend of policing, you know, sworn that the city might descend into chaos. Those are strong words from Lori Lightfoot. Right. And what the hell is going on? It was reform, right? <laughs> This is supposed to be good, progressive prosecution. Well, I think I I would I, I don't want to speak too specifically about the case because like I'm not a lawyer and I don't know like what what goes into like the legal calculations there. But what I would say is I have been I think some progressive pro- prosecutors are taking this differently, where they are saying that they are very serious on violence crime, but not but what they want to like reform. I know you don't like that word, but I'm just going to use it here (laughs) is, is addressing like these lower level offenses. They should not be part of like, like a, as big of a part of their portfolio or whatever they do. But then there are, I, there are these instances, I think, where you just see, I don't know, overreaches or I don't know if it's overreaches or miscalculations where the, the movement goes too far. And I don't know, I've talked to some of these progressive prosecutor candidates in the past, not necessarily ones who got elected, but, and sometimes I ask them like, well, what's, what's your plan for violent crime? Because presumably one of the old criminal justice reform mantras was we need to stop focusing on these low level offenses. So we can focus more on these higher level offenses. Right. So that, that's usually where I, I come from with that question is like, if that's true, what's your plan for violent crime? And I've been surprised how often they do not have an answer at all so like it's not did, just me i've been frustrated too when i in good faith and politely ask for engagement saying tell me what your plan and and it's silence they, right. it's, it's just they shut down and i go well, this is not this is an important job um 
this this is a childish response to not have a response. Right. I mean, I think there are some progressive prosecutors who I, I think have handled it better. Uh, like uh, I think Larry Krasner has handled the like whole situation politically just much, much better than like Fox and, and Chicago. And I, I think a big reason for that is because when something serious happens in his city, like violent crime, he'll speak openly about how it's bad. And it's like, I don't know, I, I think at some point that's been lost by by some parts of this movement. And I find it odd. It is definitely unsettling because e- even if you actually believe that, for example, um, the the like prison sentences are still too high for even violent crimes, at the end of the day, nobody's saying that like you should let people free after they commit a violent crime like the prison sentence might be five years instead of 10 years or 10 years instead of 20 years but that does not mean no prison sentence at all right like at least in the public understanding i think that's how it works yeah you know canada has sentences that are roughly half the length of the united states they do okay i think sentences are too long i I want more people convicted of crimes and sentenced to less time the length is so arbitrary um, it's almost right. yeah, like a way to show frustration. Yeah, what, what five years as opposed to 10. I, I'm generally down with that. Right. Um, the prosecution part, though, to say they won't prosecute minor offenses. First of all, minor offenses are real offenses like quality of life issues. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody is soliciting Johns outside my house, I want police to be able to enforce that. But that was recently um, struck off the criminal legal code of New York State, for instance, or to say, look, shoplifters were never doing prison time. Um, Nonviolent offenders, by and large, were not doing prison time anyway. By and large, shoplifters weren't getting prosecuted. Um, But there's a big difference between not prosecuting minor crimes and having a blanket policy of non-prosecution. Right. And that idea of not having discretion, of not saying, oh, sure, we're, we care about this, even if we don't really. Um, that, I think, is the big shift that I think is counterproductive. In a way, it's, it is messaging. Um, I mean, and these, you know, shoplifting has changed in cities that have stopped enforcing, have stopped prosecuting shoplifting. Well, I think it, it's there's two things there. One is like, I don't know when prop property crimes got wrapped up into this, but like property crimes do actually hurt people, right? Like that's their livelihood you're stealing in in some cases. And I don't know when it got to the point where like stealing $5,000 worth of stuff from a store that maybe is not even running very high profit margins to begin with is, is like not considered a serious crime to me. That is a serious crime. Right. So like, well, see, now it, you're getting reactionary. This is why they're <laughs> going to revoke your progressive card. But like, I think the important distinction here is like, is this crime hurting somebody else? And like, there's, there's a lot of gray in this, but it is mo- much easier to argue that like drug use and drug possession is not necessarily hurting somebody else. So maybe that should fall into public health framework instead of the criminal justice framework. Right. And you can work from there and like decide what, what, what's the nuance and all of that. But I, I think that's gotten lost in the movement at some point, just like low level offenses became any offense that isn't a shooting or murder. And I don't know, that seems, and, and rape is like obviously a, a big progressive cause as well, like taking that more seriously, but like otherwise uh, it, it kind of feels like low-level offense has just become too big of a a, a term. Like it, it carries more crimes than I think people should be comfortable with. But the the other thing there is, I, and I think this is one thing you were alluding to here is like there's a lot of good research and evidence showing that like what matters is certainty of punishment, not like severity of punishment. And we just need to apply that into our laws better. And I think when you say we will not prosecute any of these shoplifting cases, for example, that is that like makes the certainty of getting prosecuted zero percent instead of 30 percent. And like if that's really what matters for deterring crime, then like, of course, that's going to have an effect. Of course, you're going to see more more of those cases. And it's something you want to stop. You know, people like ending interviews with, you know, give me something optimistic. Well, give me something pessimistic. What are we, what, what are we, what are you most afraid of? I think um, the, the fact that we just had what is by any metric, the, like, one of the largest social movements ever with the George Floyd protests in, in the past year. And there has been essentially no federal legislation seriously moving through like real fed i know there's been stuff at the margins but i mean like a serious like rethinking of like how all this stuff works speaks Which to did me happen as a, after in the after the 60s and and, and the, the right Commission that there was federal 
that was substantial funding research um things changed right like the fact that we didn't have that even as democrats took congress and even as republicans like seemed like to genuinely want to work with democrats on this issue just shows like how dire this so situation what, what is. Would you maybe this can un, in, a, in maybe this will end up being optimistic. What specific reform would you like to see? Do you have to, do you think there's some low hanging fruit that you go that 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 would make things better at a federal level? Hmm. Well, it would just be I don't know. It, it got mocked a lot, but the, like the aid can't wait stuff that they suggested. It, it's I'm not sure how effective all that stuff would be. I, I don't think the research is as strong as like the, they were suggesting as an advocacy group, but it's like just stuff that people in general support, like, and might help. Right. Like I'm talking about stuff like, like body cameras saying that police shouldn't like put people like put their knees on people's necks. Right. Like if that's stuff that has wide popular support and if it does, and maybe, you know, it's not going to solve the entire problem, but if it helps, why not do it? Like that, that's the kind of low hanging fruit I'm thinking about. And you would think Congress would be able to do it because it's popular and because basically no one's really going to protest at like cops, like carrying body cameras. There's just not that, obviously you would see some like civil rights, civil liberties framing of that, but generally a large segment of the population supports that kind of stuff. So why not try it? If and it, it could, and see if it does and help. that's one of the things that money would, provide the difference because the right. performers that don't do it say they can't well they say they can't afford it but it's right and that, that's really money I, I named that one because it's a federal a thing where the federal government as, as you know right like most policing is done at the local and state level anyway so it's not like the federal government has a lot of direct control over this but just like throwing a crap ton of money at these places to, to buy a body cameras like you know I, I don't know if that'll help that much but it's it's worth trying and if the federal government's going to be spending 3.5 trillion dollars over the next 10 years or who knows how, how much that gets shrunk to and it's in this big bill they're talking about now maybe throw some stuff in there uh, along these lines hmm. um that's great thank you very much um let me wrap this up because i don't get much feedback on this at all but if i do it's always like man it was a little long <laughs> hey no one's forcing you to listen all the way through but if you have thank you i'm here with herman lopez i am peter moscos um this has been quality policing um there's always more at um qualitypolicing.com so um check that out and thanks for listening and um we'll see how long it is before the next one of these <laughs> <laughs>